Surfactant Replacement in Neonates by Dr. Brian Walsh. Introduction and Background. Well, welcome. My name is Brian Walsh. I'm a respiratory therapist at Boston Children's Hospital. Today I'm going to talk to you about surfactant replacement therapy for preterm term neonates with respiratory distress syndrome. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, respiratory failure secondary to surfactant deficiency is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in preterm infants. Surfactant therapy substantially reduces mortality and respiratory morbidity for this population. There may be an additive effect when combined with antenatal steroids. Surfactant deficiency can contribute to acute respiratory morbidity in late preterm and term neonates with meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumonia, sepsis, and perhaps pulmonary hemorrhage. Surfactant replacement therapy may be beneficial for those infants as well. The efficacy of exogenous surfactant administration was well established in the early 1990s in the treatment of those premature infants. Systematic reviews of randomized controlled trials confirm that surfactant administration in preterm infants with established respiratory distress syndrome reduces mortality, decreases pulmonary insult by lowering the risk of air leak and chronic lung disease. Subsequent trials indicate that prophylactic surfactant or early administration of surfactant resulted in fewer pneumothoraces, less pulmonary interstitial emphysema, and improved survival without bronchiopulmonary dysplasia. However, recent data recognize the benefits of prophylactic surfactant administration must be weighed against the risk of intubation and positive pressure ventilation. This change in practice is reflected in the most recent AAP guidelines regarding respiratory care of preterm infants. Switching to the treatment of term or near-term neonates, surfactant treatment improves oxygenation and reduces the need for ECMO without an increase in morbidity in neonates with meconium aspiration syndrome. Surfactant treatment in infants with congenital diaphragmatic hernia does not appear to improve clinical outcomes. Composition and function of surfactant. So what is surfactant? Endogenous surfactant is a biochemical compound composed of phospholipids, neutral lipids, and proteins that form a layer between the terminal airways, alveolar surfaces, and alveolar gas. Surfactant is secreted by type 2 pneumocytes and functions to reduce collapse during end exhalation by decreasing surface tension within the terminal airways and alveoli. This animation depicts end exhalation collapse that occurs without surfactant. The second animation depicts how surfactant prevents end exhalation collapse. Indications. Indications for surfactant therapy or surfactant deficiency due to prematurity or lung injury that eliminates surfactant or hinders surfactant function, such as meconium aspiration, pneumonia, or blood aspiration. Complications. Complications that exist with surfactant therapy are transient airway obstruction. This can be the obstruction of the endotracheal tube. It can be hypoxia related to that transient obstruction, bradycardia, or hypoventilation. Unilateral surfactant administration from a malpositioned endotracheal tube, increased compliance and FRC that leads to air leak, hyperoxia, hyperventilation resulting in changes in cerebral blood flow, patent ductus arteriosus, and pulmonary hemorrhage. Recommendations. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, current recommendations are, one, preterm infants born at less than 30 weeks gestation who need mechanical ventilation because of severe RDS should be given surfactant after initial stabilization. Two, using CPAP immediately after birth with subsequent selective surfactant administration should be considered as an alternative to routine intubation with prophylactic or early rescue surfactant administration in preterm infants. Three, rescue surfactant may be considered for infants with hypoxic respiratory failure attributable to secondary surfactant deficiency, excluding congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Four, surfactant therapy should be managed by nursery or transport personnel with the technical and clinical expertise to administer surfactant safely and deal with multi-system illnesses. Case example. So let's use a case to describe how we would actually deliver surfactant. So this is baby boy AJ, who is 27 weeks gestational age infant weighing 880 grams, has been intubated for severe respiratory distress syndrome. He is on assist control volume ventilation 
with a tidal volume that is set to 4.5 mLs per kilo with a peak inspiratory pressure in the high 20s, a respiratory rate of 30, and an oxygen requirement of 50%. His chest x-ray is consistent with respiratory distress syndrome and his endotracheal tube is in the correct position. When you look at the ventilator prior to surfactant, you can see that the peak inspiratory pressure is in the high 20s in that 27 to 28 range. When you review his blood gas, it uh, has a pH of 7.35, has a CO2 of 43.6, a PaO2 of uh, 76.1, remember this is on 50%, and a bicarbonate of 24, giving him an oxygen index of 5. There are largely two types of surfactant on the market, animal-derived and synthetic-derived. Dosing is according to manufacturer, with most approximating 100 milligrams per kilo of phospholipids per dose. When it comes to delivering surfactant, you first want to warm the surfactant to room temperature. If you have the time, you can actually take it out of the refrigerator and place it in room temperature for 20 minutes. Or if you're short on time, you can hold it in your hands for approximately eight minutes. Next, you wanna wash your hands and put on personal protective equipment, including goggles. You wanna inspect the surfactant for discoloration, a broken seal, or an expiration date. However, you do not want to shake it. You want to aseptically aspirate the appropriate dose without foaming and I would suggest using a large bore needle to do this. You want to assess the patient for need of suctioning prior to surfactant administration. Next, you want to choose the appropriate catheter size. Here at Boston Children's Hospital, we use an inline system that allows us to keep the patient on the ventilator while delivering surfactant administration. Alternatively, you can use a small bore feeding tube or an umbilical catheter as long as it's less than six French as you don't want to obstruct the majority of the endotracheal tube. Next, you want to determine the safe administration catheter depth. The goal is to go to the tip of the endotracheal tube, but not beyond. So for example, if you have an endotracheal tube that's 12 centimeters long and the ET tube adapter is three centimeters, this means that you should not go past the 15 centimeter mark on the catheter. Next, you want to consider the dead space of the catheter. Some people have used air or additional surfactant to actually wash out this dead space. Next, you want to perform a timeout. You suspect that AJ has surfactant deficiency from prematurity. He's required intubation despite CPAP. He has a significant oxygen requirement and ventilatory support. His endotracheal tube is in proper position, as you saw on the chest x-ray. We've identified the team. We have one person to watch the monitor and to help turn. The second person is to deliver surfactant, and you have equipment available for reintubation and resuscitation if needed. This video depicts the way that we do it at Boston Children's Hospital. First, the dose is divided into two aliquots. We turn the patient on one side and instill the first half of the dose. We wait approximately 30 seconds to a minute for the surfactant to be distributed. Next, we reposition the neonate to the opposite side and instill the second aliquot. During this process, we're monitoring for observation of chest rise and fall, oxygen saturation, heart rate, tidal volume, FiO2, and how much oxygen is required to keep the sats between 90 and 95. We monitor for signs of reflux of surfactant. When it comes to complications, we expect a slight to moderate desaturation. If beyond moderate or bradycardia occurs, suspend the administration and allow the patient to recover. Rarely does the ET2 become blocked or surfactant have to be removed. And you also want to carefully adjust the ventilator as needed. When it comes to follow-up, we want to monitor respiratory system compliance and other indices of oxygen and ventilation. Carefully for the first 15 minutes following the installation and then another full assessment one hour following delivery. You want to attempt to avoid suctioning for at least one to two hours if possible. Here's the ventilator following surfactant administration. You will see that the peak inspiratory pressure has nicely come down into the low 20s and high teens, followed by an FiO2 now down from 50% to 30%. It is expected that the respiratory system compliance will improve. If you're in pressure ventilation, this will result in an increase in tidal volume and minute ventilation if not manually adjusted. You want to prevent swings in CO2. 
Volume ventilation will result in a more consistent minute ventilation. However, it's anticipated that the peak inventory pressure will decrease. With improving compliance, pulmonary vascular resistance may fall and oxygenation improve. This will require vigilance to adjust and prevent swings in oxygenation. You also need to monitor for pulmonary edema or hemorrhage from left to right shunting. Repeat dosing of surfactant should not be considered more than every 12 hours unless surfactant is being inactivated by an infectious process, meconium, or blood. Thank you very much for watching. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.